realize we don't have that book, the theme building book at, at our library. Oh, you don't have it? You no. buy it at the airport. Yeah. yeah okay. Oh, is that my copy? Yeah, that's your copy. Oh, oh. Because when uh, I was doing some research. Yes, I uh, it's I a... we did, but we don't. It's, it's a kind of a strange arrangement. Uh, and and uh, they tell you there's no charge for the book, but we suggest <laughs> a donation oh. or something. It's it's very strange. Huh. You you can't just buy it. I don't think they've got a price on the cover. I think they. I looked on Amazon and it was selling for like eighty dollars. Really? Yeah, at Amazon. But you say they sell it at the airport? The, they they used to. Yeah. Where? Which part of the airport? I don't know because I bought mine. Being as I was one of the authors of it, I bought mine. I don't know somehow because I did the work on it. But they yes, you should, gave you, a copy. you should definitely have it. Yeah, no, I know, we realized oh. that. And incidentally, the name of the guy who really wrote that book Thank you so much. Uh, is Victor Cusack. You know of him? I've heard of him, yeah. Yeah, uh, Victor, Victor may be dead now, but uh, that was not many years ago. And uh, he he, okay. he sounded to me like he was kind of faily when I talked to him on the phone. Do you want some more water? Uh, no, thanks. Okay. And uh, uh, you may have trouble uh, reaching uh, whoever it is you buy that from. You may have to pay 80 bucks and get it from Amazon. Yeah, I saw. That's what I saw. Yeah. No, I think it's probably the quickest way. Yeah, I'm going to look next. I'm always in and out of LAX, so one time when I'm stuck, I'm going to take a look. I'm going to go on a search. I don't know. There. They might be selling it there. Oh, I'll show you the little model that I had made. Shandra, okay. could you get me the model? The, the, yeah. yeah it's what all... I want is somebody to do a beautiful little plastic one with a nightlight in it. And That's, a, at the nice. That's yeah. a good idea. I'm going to tell our I'm going to tell our bookstore about that. What, what does she want? An idea of the LAX theme building with a nightlight in it. Oh. Nightlight. <laughs> That's a really good idea. I like that idea. No, I've got a beautiful. Yes. I've got a beautiful little uh, model. Uh, that's a really good. That's a good idea. Yeah, this was made by a professional. Of course, it's heavy and it's expensive. Wow, look at that! It's beautiful. Yeah, nice. Wow. And uh, silver. Uh, the nickel. I think. Oh. Yeah, but you you can't buy them because uh, I uh, this guy had his picture in the paper for making building models. Here, Shannon. <laughs> Do you want to hold uh, it for a second so Francois can see it? Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. You hold, you hold it for one oh, second. Oh, yeah. oh, oh. Hold it up a little bit, yeah. Yeah. Who and made that? Then don't touch your mic. Well, I mean, uh, am I on now? Yes. Oh. Uh, yeah, I, I, I saw pictures in the Times one day of a model maker who was making models of buildings all over the world. And uh, I got in touch with him and asked him about the airport theme structure. And he said he wanted to make one, but he didn't know how to go about it. He didn't have the plans. And I told him, well, I can give you all the dimensions and everything. And uh, so I gave them to him. And he made these. And uh, they're made out of nickel and something. And uh, uh, they cost like 250 bucks. And he said, you know, nobody's going to be buying them in the, in the store. And uh, I said, no, but I'll, I'll, I'll buy a couple of them. Well, he gave me one, and I bought the other one. And uh, and, then, and that was it. These are just the models, the, the, the forerunners he made. He never did go into mass production. And uh, so they're very accurate uh, models. It's really nice looking here. I can yeah, they're, they're beautiful. Very heavy, too. Yeah, very heavy. So, okay. The term structural elegance. Yeah, uh, I, I was a member of so the... Off, just start off by saying the term. Just repeat oh. that, yeah. Well, uh, I'll, uh, I'll kind of okay. describe the term okay. as I go along. All right, fair enough, yeah. Uh, because I had, a, I had a definite reason for picking that word. And uh, the, uh, uh, I was a, a member of the Aesthetics Committee of the American Society of Civil Engineers, uh, for uh, buildings, and uh, 
I went to a lot of their meetings and I communicated with them by email and all that stuff. And as I did this, I became aware of what I thought was a fact. And that is that they're really getting nowhere. Um, they, they were, their idea of structural beauty it was, it was okay, but it was limited. And uh, the, the, the thing that impresses me with, uh, with, when, a, when somebody does a great structure, the thing that I like to see in it is where he has taken hopefully one concept, and that concept has solved all the problems that you, you finally get the one overriding thing that you conceive of and all your problems are, are solved with that solution. And uh, that's not the way they approached it uh, in the committee. Uh, they, they were taking it, well, the guy's got pretty shade lines and he took the architect's idea and faithfully reproduced it and that sort of thing. Uh, that, 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 I didn't find that sufficient to, to, to warrant a building that you really admire structurally. Well, I'll tell you a beautiful, simple example. The San Francisco Bridge, the Golden Gate Bridge. Now, there is a structure anybody can look at and they can see, my God, how simple. It's got two big, tall towers that go up, a cable that drapes between them, and that's the whole concept. And there you have a building that's spanning 4,200 feet or something, uh, and, and carrying all this traffic and all that, and there's no other concept, that's it. That is elegance. And uh, so I proposed that we shouldn't even have a structural aesthetics committee. We should have a structural elegance committee where we define what elegance is. See, if we, if we try to define uh, beauty, then we start tangling with the architect. And you know, what is beauty? You know, you get into all this philosophy and everything. And I said, forget all that, let's do it where we define it by what we think it is. And so sometimes it just takes tremendous guts. There are some structures that, uh, where guys have proposed them that nobody else has done. They've used their brain to put everything together that they can and think of everything they can but yet there's no precedent for it, and they build it, and it works fine. I mean, now there's a case where it may not be a beautiful building, what is done, but it may be something that takes a lot of guts. Like a perfect example of that is the giant shell, the world's biggest shell in Paris that was done like, I don't know, 50 years ago. And uh, it's a huge thing. It's a a triangle, 720 feet on the side, rises up, I don't know, 200 and some feet in the air. It's not beautiful, it's sure spectacular. And when these guys did this, they did all kinds of new things in it, and they were, they were a contracting firm that had engineers working for them uh, that uh, conceived of this design in competition with more conventional designs and got it with uh, uh, with a cheaper price. I mean, what a tremendous sort of an accomplishment. And then to, to take these new ideas that have never been tried on this tremendous scale and say, we're, we're, not, we're gonna go ahead and build this, taking, risking the whole future of the company on it and having it built and standing there now 50 years later. That's elegance, but it's not really beauty, but that's a great achievement for an engineer. Now I mentioned, or we mentioned, a while ago, uh, the uh, Tarzana ice rink. Now there I mentioned that it was, you know, the architect had all these uh, restrictions that he had to meet. And, and I finally came up with the idea that solved everything. One shape solved everything. That's what I would call one of my elegant buildings. There were other buildings where I just simply did the engineering and pieced it together, and uh, you know, maybe it turned out to be a beautiful building, 
but it, well, there was no real structural elegance in it. So that is my idea of what structural elegance is. And I proposed this, and of course I knew it wasn't going to be accepted, because that would be different. Say, so, I mean, no, we've been having this committee, structural beauty, for 100 years or something. You know, we're going to keep on doing it. And uh, so I just, I resigned. I didn't say I resigned over that, but I just thought, oh, it's hopeless. I'm not going to bother wasting time with these guys. Uh, but I wrote that paper on structural elegance. And there, right now there is an engineer, he's also an architect, who's writing a book on, uh, on structural, he was writing it on structural beauty. But uh, last, I just got a, uh, an email from him last night, and I think he's now calling it structural elegance. He, he, he has my uh, paper, and I, I think he's, he sees the point that he, he agrees with it. And, uh, you know, so maybe in another hundred years they'll be calling it structural elegance. Um, who were some of the other structural engineers that were working in Los Angeles in the 1950s and 60s? Well, you mean who were doing outstanding work? Or you yeah. mean just how, who were the, who no, were? who were doing, who were some of your colleagues? That well, there were, there were a couple of uh, young guys, uh, but uh, they, they never uh, developed. Uh, there was a guy named uh, Andrew Nasser. He ended up doing Lautner's uh, engineering after I quit. Uh, and, uh, and he had done some very nice uh, shells uh, for an engineering firm named Johnson and Nielsen in Pasadena. And I thought that... Uh, uh, you know, he might kind of take over from, from me someday. I don't mean working for me, but I mean just take over because he's younger than I am by at least a generation. And, uh, but he didn't. He, instead of that, he went to work for contractors and uh, I, he just dropped out of sight. He's around, he's still working, he's still alive. Uh, but uh, uh, he just never followed through on wanting to do nothing but uh, structural design. He got into with working with builders and uh, let's see who else was there well there were various guys that sort of came and went and uh, they just didn't they, they just just weren't as dedicated solely to producing uh, structural designs that were elegant as I was. I mean, that doesn't make me better than them, it just makes me different. And so they got sidetracked into other things. And I probably, rec yes, there was an engineer, yeah, he was a very good engineer, uh, named Bowen, Jerry Bowen, yeah, B-O-W-E-N. Uh, and he did the, uh, the big housing tracked, oh God, what's it called? Been there for many years, 60, 70 years. Uh, I, I, when Shannon comes back, uh, she'll remember because a friend of hers lives there. Where is it? It's about 6th and... Downtown? Yeah, it's downtown. Not, not right downtown, but west side of downtown. Uh, Oh, the Park La Brea, Park oh, La Brea. Park La Brea, yeah, yeah, sure. you, yeah. You know that project? Yeah, of course, yeah. Okay, yeah. Park La Brea, uh, when it was done many years ago, uh, before 1961, this was done in the 50s, uh, they had, uh, uh, I think they finally built 18, 13 story buildings or something there, done by an insurance company, Prudential, or one of the great big insurance companies. And uh, uh, Jerry Bowen's father was a structural engineer, and Jerry Bowen um, was uh, the actual designer of it. He was uh, about my age. And Jerry came up with an invention that was a very clever invention, very complicated, and he solved it all. And I, I don't want to explain it because it's just too difficult to explain without models, and uh, uh, came up with a structural system for designing all those floors, 
over and over again, 13 times 18 floors, all alike. And uh, uh, they were built from his system. And then I used his system later on, uh, on Mount Sinai, the original Mount Sinai. Well, it's not the real original. Orig real original, I think, was at a different location, but the one that's on Beverly Boulevard. Uh, I did the original one there. Uh, and I also did an apartment house uh, with it, and it worked fine. I got wonderful results. But uh, Jerry did a building for a, some kind of an aerospace firm uh, that had quite large spans, and they got very large deflections, and so that the cabinets that were supposed to be against the wall leaned inward and so just, you know, unsatisfactory. And it wiped him out. And it so discouraged him, he, I never heard of him coming up with anything again. And he was like in his 30s at that time. And uh, so there's a guy who it was a brilliant guy and had a lot of future ahead of him. And he just got beaten by this one project that went sour. Yeah. So th there were other guys around. Okay, so for my last question, we talked a little bit about the beginning of the idea of the role of labor. So, you know, you're working with an architect, but there's all these other people that are involved in actually building the building. So, can you talk a little bit about, you know, those different roles of labor and all the people that... Oh, you mean uh, like the role of the contractor? Yeah, yeah. And just all these, you know, well, what yes. is Well, when, when you get, when you're doing a new complex structure, one thing you've got to be aware of and make sure you solve is that when this goes out in the field and goes to uh, the builders, uh, in those days at least, many of them uh, never went to college and they don't have training in um, higher mathematics or any mathematics. And they're going to think that this is going to be very complicated. And if you've done your work right, you have simplified it tremendously. So it really isn't complicated, even though it may look complicated. And so when I, when I was doing this with shells, for instance, I would run across this all the time, where I had very uh, complicated, doubly curved things intersecting each other. But I never did that stuff just randomly. I always knew how to do it in a simple way or I wouldn't use it. And so what I would do, I would call, call the bidders together and I would show them how to do it, sometimes with examples, with sticks and stuff. Uh, and I would just, sometimes it would just stun them that something that looks extremely complicated can all be done with straight lines, just straight line sticks. And, uh, but you take them and you, you move them and you end up with a, a doubly curved, complicated surface. And this was very important because you would accomplish more than just educating the contractors. You would make them enthusiastic. Instead of now having a bunch of guys that were thinking, oh, you know, these goddamn highfalutin college guys that are, uh, they, they got their heads somewhere else, and uh, they never think about the practical stuff. Instead of that, you would find these guys going around bragging to others, hey, I know how to do this, and here's how I'm going to do it, and all this. You would make them an ally. And so uh, this is the way that you would get around dealing uh, with people who were sometimes not educated at all in the things that you were doing. And uh, so it's, it's, that was a part of the training of what you must learn. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that's <laughs> great. I think that's it. I think we covered pretty much everything. So I hope we didn't go too long. Did we? Was that? Was did? Do we feel like you covered what we what we should have talked about? I think we did well. Well, uh, I, it's did I exhaust you? it's certainly different than I thought. Uh, I didn't realize I was just going to run on. And on no, and on. no, no. It was really. <laughs> I thought you were going to ask me specific questions about specific buildings, but that's fine. You know, like you talked about the 
uh, King Cole Market. The, the, we, the, didn't, the, we didn't even touch on that. No, uh, the most interesting thing about the King Cole Market, right. <laughs> here's one for you. Uh, the King Cole Market, you know, is, is arches that come out of the ground, go up and form the roof uh, of the building, and then go down into an arch, the other end of the arch at the ground. Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, oh, they've even got the kids for the bicycles. Well, here's what they found. After they got the building built, uh, the architect or somebody went out there on a weekend, and these kids were taking their bicycles and riding them up on the roof. Uh, yeah, you, you couldn't do it here. There's something here. But uh, in, in general, you could start at one arch and you could ride clear over and go down to the ground and go back and go back over another arch. And these kids were doing this dangerous stuff. It's ironic that you've got a, a well, picture. And this is a Julia Shulman photo. <laughs> this is Julia Shulman who took the photograph. So What's that? Julia Shulman, the oh, photographer. Oh, oh, that, oh this yeah, is yeah. a photograph of his. So he must have staged the oh, kids. Oh, it must have. Yeah, maybe it was Julia Shulman who found him doing that. Yeah. <laughs> he must have staged the kids doing that. And that was, that was that you were saying that was a wood structure, the king. Yeah, that was a wooden arch, uh, springing off of a concrete abutment. But it was just a wooden arch, and then filled in with studs. And, I mean, uh, with the two by eights or something. And it was a conventional construction, really. Was there like because everything in LA had to be seismic, seismically? stable was there a challenge for a lot of these things to make oh sure yeah oh sure yeah we we california uh, was the leader in uh, uh, anti-earthquake design and uh, we had uh, the strict laws that the rest of the country didn't have the rest of the country is now adopting most of our laws and uh, so yes we had this additional uh, control over our designs that it must conform to uh, seismic forces, which made some very complicated problems. But today, the, the things that we did today that were special are becoming used all over the country because they realize now you can have an earthquake almost anywhere in the United States. It may only occur once in 500 years, but if you get 500 places, you got one once a year. <laughs> yeah, that's right. All right, that's great. Did you get it, first of all? Yeah, of course. Okay, perfect. I'm going to take a picture before. Well, you heard about that earthquake in Italy the other day. Uh, yes, well, the, the very sad part about it, of course, is that it's shaken down a bunch of ancient buildings. You know, they're unreinforced. They're just masonry. Our, our masonry buildings are reinforced. We have reinforcing steel in them. Well, that... That earthquake was the worst in that area since the 1300s. Oh, wow. And it was only a six. Yeah, only a six. And a six is not a major earthquake. No. Nope. But um, so many of you, but it's interesting to see, like, some of those structures were built hundreds of years ago and have withstood whatever kind of... Yes, 